Um, I am Srihari. I uh, work at Nalenso. Um, uh, we are a software cooperative based in Bangalore, and I really w like working here. Um, so today I'm here to um, share with you my experiences in uh, building and instrumenting a Postgres cluster uh, ourselves. Um, and today I'm going to be telling you uh, stories. One second, does this work? Oh no, it's cool. It's cool, I'll use the computer. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be telling you um, stories from the time um, we worked um, on building the Postgres cluster. Obviously, things didn't work and things failed miserably. So, these are those stories. And I'll tell you uh, what we've learned from them. So, in each story, I'm going to tell you uh, what really happened and uh, what went bad. And I'll tell you what we did to get things up and running really quick. And then um, what the root cause was and how we dug into that and how um, we learned from that and ensured that uh, that doesn't happen again. But before I tell you these stories, um, it's essential to establish some context around why uh, we built things the way we did. So um, the business uh, is essentially that of an experimentation platform. Uh, so this is a, a microservice, a service um, that other services talk to. So it's uh, consumers are machines. Um, and machines can call us very fast, and they do. Um, and what's important here is that um, the experimentation platform was used to drive decisions based on data. So they would, dis they would uh, decide which product to use amongst two vendors or which algorithm to use uh, amongst, with, amongst um, many algorithms based on the numbers that the experimentation platform gave them. And uh, these had to be accurate to the level of the seventh decimal point, uh, which was kind of bizarre, but true. And we had to ensure that uh, our system gave them that accuracy. And it needed to do two things as an, ex as an experimentation platform. So the first thing that it needs to do is uh, tell people um, which bucket they belong to in an experiment very abstractly. And another thing, so that's the real time service. Um, and you have the API calls. And the, on the other hand, you need to report between these um, uh, buckets of an experiment and say that this thing did so much better than the other. Right? That's very abstract. It's, it's a lot more complex than that, but I'm just going to leave it at that for now. And um, I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of detail here, but I do want to justify that um, for us, data integrity was primary, and PostgreSQL is amazing at its storage. And we needed um, a transactional relational database that had storage as one of its primary concerns, and Postgres was it. And um, most of our uh, requests to the database need to be under five milliseconds or so, uh, and Postgres could give us that. And um, like I said, the reporting uh, needs were such that we had um, to think about a medium-sized uh, data warehouse, about a few TBs, and ensure that we could report over them. So um, this is what our numbers look like right now. Um, so we have an SLA to say that um, most of the requests, 99.9% .9 of them, have to be served under 10 milliseconds. And um, we have a transaction rate of around 4,500 per second. Um, this is actually not uh, something amazing or, or in the big data realm or, or anything, but I would say that this is uh, very sizable for uh, a real-time transactional database uh, that is about 600 gigs long. And our biggest table, which we report on and write to quite often, is just, a, just above a billion rows. And um, all our databases run on EC2, on I2X large instances. So we have uh, it backed up with um, provision IOPS. With that, I'm going to tell you my first story, uh, which was in about um, February 2014. Um, and this was us um, re-architecturing the system a bit and trying to understand what we can do um, to make it more resilient, right? So we sat down and we were looking at different solutions to uh, enable uh, high availability for Postgres. So here's the thing. We needed a read replica, right? Because we knew that um, 
we need live reports, which meant that uh, we need the reporting machine needs to get the data just about the same time um, our transactional database also got it, which meant that we could use synchronous replication. So at this time, RDS did not have uh, support for Postgres read replicas, right? So that was straight out of the picture. Um, but there was another thing, right? That we couldn't be down for more than five seconds. And down, I mean um, that the service could not be down for more than five seconds, and it was um, bottlenecked at our DB. And so that meant that our DB cannot be down for more than five seconds. So this meant that we needed what was called automatic failovers, right? Um, so now RDS has um, read replicas and it has multi-AZ um, failovers and such, but it still doesn't cut it because five seconds is too small even for RDS. So we needed that. And um, we knew in Postgres land there must be something that can help us here. Um, so we looked into a few tools, right? And these were the tools that um, were there at the moment. So one of the more popular tools there was uh, pgpool, right? Um, and it did a lot of things. And that kind of scared us a bit. Um, so being new to this, what we wanted to do was ensure that we had a firm grip um, on everything that was happening and a good control so that if anything goes wrong, we'll be able to like dig in and fix it. And pgpool did not give us that, right? It was so much abstraction that it posed a black box on us, and that was not acceptable. Um, Bucardo did something slightly different. Actually, it did something quite different. So it did multi-master replication and asynchronous replication. We needed synchronous, so that was also out of the picture. But Rep Manager seemed like um, a win at the moment. So it did one thing, which is um, manage replication and do automatic failovers, and it seemed to do it well. And it's written by the uh, second quadrant team, which is very respected in the PostgreSQL community. Um, so we looked at it, and um, we were able to make it work. <coughs> so this is what our cluster looked like at the moment, right? So we have uh, rep manager daemons running on each machine. There's passwordless SSH access between all the rep manager daemons so that they can talk to each other. Um, and we have a master DB and synchronous replication between the standbys. Um, and Rep Manager maintains its own table uh, inside, and this is sort of uh, its list of nodes and uh, their priorities and uh, what their statuses are at the moment. And uh, just to give you uh, an understanding of how uh, Rep Manager is used, this is basically it. It has like a few commands to, to say uh, clone the standby or uh, promote this standby to a master or do a switchover. Uh, so it's that simple. So this is what our setup looks like, right? So we have an application that's load balanced, um, and it's all talking to one database. And one of the applications is the reporting service, so that talks to one of the standbys, which is a reporting DB. Um, so all this was fine, but we had overlooked one thing, right? And what we had overlooked was that while Rep Manager does handle uh, the failover within the database cluster itself, it does not handle, it does not tell the application that a failover has happened. So this was something that we needed to do ourselves, right? Um, and turns out that this wasn't that hard at all. Uh, so consider that you have a failover, right? Um, so right now, one standby went down, and um, one, one, your master DB went down, and your standby became a master, but your application still continues to, the, continues to talk to the master that went down. And a Rep Manager has a hook, right? So it says, Here's a promote command, and I'm going to run a script when I'm going to promote um, a standby to a master, and you can do whatever you want within that. And so that was simple. So what we had to do is just send an API call to the machine saying, here's your database configuration now. Point yourself to the new database. And that was fairly simple. Um, and it seemed a bit raw, um, but that was fine at the moment. Um, and we added another line of defense because we thought it was necessary. right? Um, so the second line of defense was that the application knew about the cluster. This was a conscious choice. And the application could then um, go to each machine and ask it, are you a standby or a master, and uh, sort of pull that as well. So if the cluster configuration had changed and the push from the rep manager to the, data, to the application had failed, this would still work. Right? So this was a nice second line of defense. And uh, with this, we were confident enough to go to production. Um, we did a bunch of tests locally, and integration 
performance. And then we went on, went to production, and uh, Philip, our head of engineering, said, do a failover and showed me that it works. And the first time, it did not. Um, and it did not the time after that. But we knew enough about uh, Rep Manager. We could like go into the code um, and understand it enough that we understood what was happening and we could fix it. Um, so that was really nice. And uh, after those two tries, the third time we got it right, and we got it right the fourth time and after that. So um, things were looking really good. Uh, now in hindsight, that does seem a bit raw, and this seems like a more straightforward way to do it, right? So you have a virtual IP mechanism that's um, facilitated by UCARP or something, or even your uh, cloud manager's virtual IP mechanism. Uh, so you can tap into that, and then only your uh, VIP mechanism knows about um, the cluster and the failover, and your app can remain ignorant about it and say, here's the IP, just talk to this database now, just talk to this IP now. Um, and that has its own flaws as well, and I'll get to it. But uh, this seems like a senior approach. And then this happened one day, right? Um, we got a notification on our phones that, hey, your AWS machine went down. And we were like, shit, this is our master database, and we should do something about it. But we went and looked at our, our consoles, and it turns out that um, we were fine. So a failover had happened, an actual disaster had occurred, and the application was talking to the right database, and everything was smooth. So this was our first success after setting all that up. Um, so what have we learned from that? What we've learned that uh, Rep Manager works, right? And it does one thing, it does it well, and the code's surprisingly readable, uh, just like Postgres, um, written by the same people, sort of. Uh, and uh, we can use a push-pull strategies or a virtual IP mechanism to do uh, the to handle the communication between the application and the cluster. And uh, we should be aware of the fact that AWS can drop our boxes and maybe test that even. And um, you can also test your failovers uh, rigorously. So what we did was we had a Vagrant setup, and uh, we had a few tests that we would run locally and like uh, sort of randomly uh, shut down a node and ensure that uh, we sort of covering all kinds of failure scenarios. Um, we had tests to run these things locally. We didn't go so far as to put this on CI, but I don't think that's impossible to do. And so with that, I'll tell you another story. So one night, um, Philippe, uh, again, head of engineering, pokes me on hip chat and says, hey, wake up. Your service is doing really bad. It's failing a silly, and you need to fix it immediately, right? Uh, so I wake up, and I look at it, and sure enough, um, where we, is, like, we were supposed to be at 99.9 percentile under 10 milliseconds, we were at 45, right? So that was like a catastrophic failure, and we had to do something to fix it. Um, and usually something like that, um, instinctively, I imagine, it would be related to a resource failure of some sort. And uh, sure enough, I looked it up, and it was the disk. But it was at 80%. Now, um, I know that we had um, let it grow up to 80%, and that was a problem we were trying to fix at the moment. But we didn't expect it to fail at 80%. We thought 90, maybe. And that even, we were only thinking about Postgres, and that should have been fine. But uh, this wasn't the time to think about that, so we need to get things up and running. So um, I got on a call with Philippe, and he was like, OK, we can lose some data, um, but we need to get the service up and running, and we need reports. So we can't lose data, we can't lose reports. Um, and this was actually not very difficult to handle at all, because we had a cluster, right? So what we see there are four databases that have the same data. Now, everything is at 80% because all the disks are the same size, um, but they all also have the same data. So they're all live backups. All the three standbys here are live backups. So if I can just take one standby out of the cluster, I can do whatever I want with the cluster, and the data is still safe there. And so that's what I did. And uh, that's actually quite easy. What you need to do is just stop the database, uh, tell Rep Manager about it, um, that I'm removing it from the cluster, and um, remove a recovery con that tells it that talk to this master, and then start it by itself as a standalone database. And we have this, that um, the standby node is now out of the cluster. And the cluster is still at 80%, but it's uh, isolated, and our data is safe there. And now we're free to delete the data from there. 
right? So I can truncate a table or something, and the requests are through, uh, and I can get reports from there. At this point, we are up and functioning, right? So we've lost some data on our uh, runtime database, but um, I can serve reports from there manually or whatever, and uh, the SLA is met. But back to that question, I thought I'd fail at 90, why 80? Um, so it turns out that it's ZFS, right? So somewhere buried in the ZFS best practices is something that says, don't go above 80%, it's probably bad for you. Uh, and then we dig it up, and then it says, uh, like, there's defragmentation issues and everything, and, like, that was a lesson learned for us. Like, 80% is critical, and we'd never touch that. But there was another problem with this, right? Um, I, I'd said that we were trying to fix it. So we were trying to delete data from Postgres all along. Um, we'd reached 80%. We thought, oh, I can delete th hundreds of thousands of rows overnight, and that should free up some space. But it hadn't. And then it struck us, like, right on the face that Postgres implements MVCC, which is multi-version concur concurrency control. And um, everything was obvious after that. Um, so what that implied was that when you delete or update a row, Postgres just basically turns a Boolean on the row that marks it invisible to transactions that follow from there. But the row is still on the disk. It's still in memory. Um, and how it handles this is have a GC-like um, auto-vacuum process that later sweeps through this and removes uh, the dead rows. And even when it does, it only reclaims it within Postgres. The data is never, almost never reclaimed back to the OS. So um, here is a rough state diagram of how this works, right? So um, you have an insert, it becomes a live top tuple, and then you have a delete that makes it a dead tuple, and there's a vacuum process that makes it, uh, that, that pushes it into the FSM, and then um, if a new row comes in, it reuses it again. So for the most part, that is a cycle there that you'll see, and Postgres just basically keeps its space within itself. And only in the rare cases where um, there's a vacuum full or a table gets rewritten, that you will have some space reclaimed to the OS, right? Um, so we need to be aware of that. So here's a snapshot of uh, some of the dashboards that we built after this incident. Um, so that's the DB size, and you'd see there the last two columns um, are sawtooth waves, which is very similar to what you'd see on a JVM GC, right? Uh, and so that's important to monitor. So what have we learned? We've learned that uh, standby is a great live backups, and we've learned that um, never go above 80% on ZFS, and uh, tune your auto-vacuum workers aggressively. So um, for big tables, the standard auto-vacuum configuration is very poor. So you have to actually test it out, ensure that you're using the right amount of disk I.O., and all that, and that's a long process. You must do it in an environment that's very close to your production environment. Um, and to ensure um, you're getting all the data you want at all times, you have to monitor your disk usage. Uh, your dead tuples ensure that you have those, your GC wave uh, sawtooth and the auto vacuum process itself. And that brings us to another story. So at this point in time, um, our service was about a year in, or no, even lesser, like about seven, eight months. And um, it worked, so people wanted to use it more. So more people uh, put up more experiments, and uh, they wanted more reports. And so what we needed was a better reporting box, right? Um, we only had four cores or something on our reporting box, and we needed to make it bigger. And so we had to do what would normally be considered a routine operation, where like add another node to your cluster, and um, that should be simple. And we had done it in the past for other instances where we had to add another standby, and everything was smooth so far. And uh, it was even this time. So I started off the clone, and it said, uh, I have started receiving wall, and um, I'm transferring at 40 Mbps. You look at GNN top or whatever, and it says, um, I'm receiving data at 40 Mbps, and I can see the disk, disk getting filled up. And at the rate, I thought that uh, next morning when I wake up, maybe five to six hours later, 
it should be fine. Like I should have my new reporting box all caught up. So the next morning, I woke up to this, right? I see that um, requested wall segment has been removed. Okay, so I didn't understand this at the moment. I understood wall, wall meant right at logs, and I knew this had to do with the replication, but I didn't really piece them all together. So let's, let's try to understand that just a bit. So when you start a clone, a rep manager by default runs a PG-based backup, right? So this is like a snapshot at some point. So um, if you run a PG dump, what it does, it, it takes a snapshot of your database at one point in time, and from there it gives you the dump. So PG based back does something very similar. But what we have to keep in mind is that the database continues to get data while the backup is getting created, right? So um, that data that comes into the database while the new clone is happening is written to the wall, right? And this is how Postgres uh, replication really works. It's just walls getting sent from the PGX log directory of one machine to the other. Um, and how this happens normally in a clone is that after the PG base back completes, um, the wall recovery starts. And this is basically where um, the standby, the new standby starts streaming the wall data from the master. And it can't start up until it has, uh, the database can't start up until it has fully caught up with master. So what we had done that previous night was somehow overflown that wall, right? So there's a limit to how much data you can keep in your PGX log. And we had set that using a wall keep segments configuration to about eight gigs, because that was more or less um, the amount of data that we got in a day. And it turns out last night we had gone beyond uh, eight hours of uh, eight gigs of data. Um, and that wasn't high enough and it had overflown. And then the standby was looking for some data on the master, which didn't exist anymore. Um, but what we had there was a 600 gig database almost that was almost caught up to the master and like about 10 gigs or something missing. And um, Rep Manager had this rsync only option, which meant that like I can just sync the files and I was like, okay, the rest of the 10 gigs should be uh, easy to transfer over. Um, and I waited, waited for two hours, three, and it didn't happen. And it was, I could still see a 100% CPU and nothing on the network. And uh, digging a little deeper, what I saw was that it was doing an rsync of the entire data directory, right? It can't do just the wall. And it was running a checksum on every file, right? So it has to do a checksum on every single file of all the 600 gigs before it can tell that this is, this, this is the data I need to transfer. So that basic, and, and then I look in the rep manager docs somewhere and it says, um, this might not essentially be faster than doing a fresh base backup. Um, and so that's what I did, right? I made the eight gigs, 80 gigs, so it could hold like 10 days data or whatever. And um, so I restarted the clone and given a light traffic day, uh, everything would work just fine. And it did. But how do we ensure that this doesn't happen again? Um, turns out this is fairly standard practice almost. So um, there is a concept of wall archiving. So what you do is as you receive walls, you send them to another box altogether, right? And you call it the wall archive. And um, Postgres uh, has a way for you to say um, that this is how I get uh, wall data from an archive. And what it does is if it can't get the data from a master, it'll try to get it from the archive, right? And that was as simple as that. There's another way to do this, which I found uh, more recently, in that you can just pass a flag to PG-based backup uh, and it will stream the wall data as it comes in parallelly. So this uh, implies that you lose one more slot where you can add a standby, but in the scheme of things, that's rather cheap. And this is uh, present since Postgres 9.2, so it's a really neat option. Um, there are downsides to this as well, uh, and I can talk about them later. But yet another way, and a way that we use often, um, is to use file system backups. <clears throat> so we use ZFS. Um, on production, and uh, we take snapshots and send them incrementally to a backup machine. This is very fast and cheap, and there's no reason why I wouldn't do it, um, or anyone shouldn't do it. Um, and ZFS send tends to be a little faster than uh, PG-based backup, so PG-based backup completes in six hours, this will finish in five and a half or so. 
so it's that it's a little better, and it it also transfers the wall um, log uh, the the wall directory w with the master file system, so you get a little more data when you clone. And after you have the snapshot of your file system on master on your new standby, you can just let it recover, and um, that's fairly clean. As long as you assume that your uh, file system snapshot itself is clean, and then you take your uh, file system snapshot after doing a Postgres checkpoint. Yeah. So what have we learned? We've learned that uh, we should think about wall recovery, right? Uh, and wall recovery is a part of clone. And we can prevent against um, wall recovery issues using uh, wall archives and rsyncing. It's slow, but it's still an option. And uh, file system backups. And uh, the things that you want to monitor while adding a new standby are network throughput and uh, DB load so that you know that you're not getting too many requests and run out of wall and in general the disk IO. And that brings us again to another story. So this was one of uh, the stories where um, the issue was um, not that uh, difficult to understand, but um, was more difficult to fix. So we had a bunch of 500s on our um, reporting service, and people were trying to get reports, and we were not able to give it to them. And we had to manually run reports and give it to them. That was bad. But um, looking in the logs, that's the error that Postgres throws. It says conflict with recovery. Right? And we kind of knew this, and we kind of knew how to protect it, but not really. Like, we hadn't encountered this issue as deeply as we did then. So we were like, OK, they're running too many queries. So let's try to understand this a bit. So um, the master database is going to get small transactions, right? So basically, scattered reads and writes. Um, but the reporting database gets a long queries, so reports that run for 10 minutes or something. Excuse me. Um, so while a report is running, the wall recovery is also happening at the same time, right? So consider uh, the scenario of, um, say, this is April. You're getting reports for April, right? Uh, and say you're running a report query for this month, and the master also is receiving requests that is changing the data for April, right? So it's not that uh, Postgres can't um, uh, have writes, that's what MVCC is about. Like You can read in parallel as writes happen, and that's fine. But in Postgres replication, it's, it, it also replicates um, the maintenance operations like vacuum. So basically, the wall there also contains the information necessary to remove rows from under the query. right? So that is not acceptable. And um, so basically, what it does is it pauses the replication pauses uh, the wall uh, redo until the query finishes. And it says that I will let you run the query for a maximum of so much time. Right? So that max standby delay there, you see, is um, dependent on source. So you have one for archive and one for streaming. And you can say how much of each you're willing to wait for. Um, so when it goes beyond that, what it does, it says, nope, you can't run anymore. I can't let you fall back. I will cancel you. So that's the error that we get when uh, it does that. And it says, canceling statement because you're conflicting with recovery. And so that goes into the opposite state, right, where your reporting service is shut off and the wall redo continues. So if you try to connect to your database then, it will refuse a connection and say that the database system is in recovery mode, you need to wait. Um, and so this was what was happening. And we need to fix it really quick. Um, and also fix it forever, but the immediate fix um, was to increase the delay, right? Um, so we were on AWS, we didn't have network issues, um, at least to what we could see, and that was fine. So we were like, we can afford a little room there, and we said, for 10 minutes or so, it's okay to run a query and uh, fall back. But what are ways to fix this properly so that it never happens again? So Postgres has one. Um, such mechanism. Um, so assume your reporting service is uh, doing a bunch of queries on your reporting database. Um, if you use a hot standby feedback, um, 
coming from. Okay, I'm just going to ignore that. So you can use a hot standby feedback uh, configuration to say that um, your reporting database should send data about what queries it's executing to master. So the reporting database can basically say, I'm running queries on April data. Don't vacuum April data. And then the master will be like, okay, I'm not going to do that. Um, but what that means is that um, it will not send wall data for that, and you can run your queries, and that, that works fine, but you don't basically run vacuum on those rows. That means that your database will bloat, right? So you don't clean up. And um, we, we were having issues with our purging, and so that was not really an option. We had enough bloat already, and so we had to look at um, another way to solve this. And one of the ways to solve this is to usually make uh, the report queries themselves faster, uh, and we did a bunch of query optimizations. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but a few questions came back to us, right? And we were like, why aren't we doing partitioning? Why aren't we using a star schema for our reporting um, database? Isn't that how you do reports normally? And we can't, right? So if we need live reports, if we need synchronous replication, and Postgres does, uh, Postgres sends you binary data, you don't really have much room there, right? Uh, you have to use the same schema as you do in master. And that was an option that we refused to take because um, the API service was critical and we could not afford to change the transactional schema, right? Um, there are other ways to do this now, and I'll talk to you about that in just a bit. But while you can't change um, Postgres replication, you can change what's around the database, right? So you change the hardware, or you change the file system. So that's what we did. We made it a bigger box. Right? Like you can change, you can take the same database, it gets the same data, but you make it faster from under it. So um, your reporting uh, databases do a large, like chunky I/O, so you can optimize for that. Um, so higher IOPS definitely helps. The other thing was ZFS record size. Right? Um, in a transactional database, you want your file system record size and your database record size to sort of match. So for Postgres, it's about 8 KB. And uh, so we tuned our ZFS to say, you can write 8 KB record. So our, so our OLTP is totally fine. Um, but uh, on reporting, like reading 8 KB at once is super slow where we want to be reading gigabytes of data. So we, we changed that to about 1 MB, and it was already 30 times faster. Right? So that uh, really solved most of our problems right there. Uh, and of course, like um, if you're running 10 minute long queries on a single database, that's going to take up a core, and so more cores really help. Uh, so what have we learned from here? We've learned that um, your queries might be canceled, so handle that. Don't throw 500s to your clients. And um, you can apply back pressure. It's an option, but you might not want to do that if it causes too much bloat. And uh, you can't use different schemas maybe, and uh, you can change the file system and hardware around Postgres without affecting replication. And uh, those are some things that you can monitor um, to ensure that that doesn't happen. Too bad we don't have a projector cluster. I, I told you, I, ha I can still share more stories with you and talk about them uh, later, but I just want to give you a bunch of scenarios um, that we prepared for that we didn't really uh, encounter in production just yet, uh, but they are still quite interesting. So um, one such scenario is a split brain, and you might have heard about it. That's when you have um, a network partition do something bad. So consider there's a network partition, and your master goes away, right? So a standby comes uh, to your master, and you have uh, a proper failover. So your app is talking to um, the new master, and your old master is unreachable, uh, right? And at this point, um, after a failover has occurred, you have your app manager table say that one node has failed, and the other two standbys are pointing to the right master, and everything's fine. Now, what happens if the node that went down came back up, right? So the network partition somehow resolved itself, and it's again reachable. So at this point, you have two masters. What do you do? Right? Your rep manager table says that this is a master, this is also a master. Uh, so the standard response in such cases 
is to shoot the other node in the head. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and some, some systems automate this, rep manager doesn't. Um, and like, if you actually notice, um, the, the cluster is totally fine. The application's talking to the right master database and no standbys knows, know about the other master database, everything's fine. It's just that uh, the other master exists and you just need to kill it. <coughs> Uh, so another such scenario could be when your application does not know about a failure, failover, right? So while a rep manager um, does the failover correctly, what if this push fails, right? You're, you're making a network uh, call and like if that got interrupted or say your promote command had a bug in it and it wasn't able to send the status right, what happens then? Um, and even with even in the VIP strategy, right? What if you have um, so rep manager does a failover in itself, and it still needs to communicate that to the virtual IP mechanism somehow? What if that fails? Um, so one of the ways to um, prevent that from happening is to have multiple lines of defense, and our push pull strategy is one of them. Um, but it's possible to think about other such scenarios where you have an external system monitoring this and ensuring that. Um, like, there are multiple ways for you to know about the failover. Um, and uh, we've actually covered a bunch of these backups. Um, and let's, like, quickly contrast them and see what we can use where. So um, a standby is a live backup, right? It's probably the best you can use. And it's the same size as the DB. And it's immediate. Uh, and you have all the data in the master there all, at all times. So that's great. But the problem is that if you accidentally delete a table, like you can connect your test to your production database and you immediately like drop a table or something that has happened. And like that will not protect you against that. Um, and wall archives are great. Uh, they are replayable, right? Like you can replay your wall archives right from the beginning of time to now and it would be all caught up. So that's great about it. Uh, and it also helps um, resurrecting stand standbys when they, are, uh, when they lag back too much. Um, but the problem with that is that they can be very big. Uh, walls are uh, slightly bigger than records in Postgres, and so these wall archives uh, would need a lot more space. And um, if you're trying to bring up an entirely new standby, this is probably not the way to go, because it involves uh, a, a lot of redo time. Um, so logical backups are essentially uh, us doing PG dumps. Uh, and these are resource intensive, so we probably don't want to do them on the master. You can do them on the standby, but you can think of them as very large queries, which means that replication will have to pause, and it's possible that doing a PG dump will mean that your standby lags back far enough that it can't recover from it. Um, but um, it's integral, right? So that's great about it. You can take it, and you can make it work even across architectures. So this is great uh, for a backup that you use to upgrade your database system. If you're moving from uh, 9.3 to 9.5 or something, this is uh, the way to go. And file system backups, I don't see why anyone wouldn't do them, right? They are fast, cheap, and if you use ZFS or something, you can um, you do snapshots and roll back, and these are great for testing. So uh, we do them all the time to test migrations. Whoops, I did something bad. OK, no problem. Just roll back and do it again. So, um, so it's really useful that way. Uh, but the problem is that um, you can run into an, in, in, into an uh, integrity risk. Um, so if you had taken the file snapshot not uh, after a checkpoint, but in between when a file was half written or something, then your database won't start up, and that's bad. Um, and yeah, so that's that. And uh, here's one last scenario, right? So you have a database, and uh, say the disk uh, under it degraded, right? So uh, you're down to 40% disk IO. Um, but this doesn't trigger a failover. It's just really slow and like returning things in 45 milliseconds instead of 10. And possibly one of your uh, standbys can take over as master. It has full disk capacity uh, and it can do that. But how do you detect something like this? How do you ensure that the standby is capable? Would you have to bring it up as a master to check it out? Because you have to write into it, right? Would you use the circuit breaker to detect this? Not really sure. So we have thought about this a bit, but I just want to leave this out there as something that you can think about and reason. Because that's essentially what um, all this kind of work involves and building resilient systems involves. And um, that's all I have. Thank you.
Thanks. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, Thanks. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I really like it because I went to some of these phases myself. Uh, I want to ask a couple of questions. One is uh, uh, about the file system backup. You said uh, it can get into integrity issues. Yeah. I want to know, like, why would that happen? So, if you didn't take a checkpoint before you took a file system backup, yeah. it's possible that um, Postgres had not written something fully in or something. Yeah, you could do PG start backup and then after that you can do rsync backup. Sorry? You can do PG start backup and then uh, do an rsync work fine, right? Um, so when you do PG start backup, I think... Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can recover after an rsync, but the file system backup then by itself is, is like, didn't work, right? You have to get around, you have, you have to fix it using an rsync. No, no, I'm saying that when you do file system backup, yeah. Uh, take the whole file system backup, either using rsync or you do whatever ZFS thing you are doing. You're right. Uh, so if you do a PG start backup before you start the process, I'm assuming that uh, it will be, become consistent and then... Uh, yeah, yeah, you can do that. As long as you take a checkpoint before yeah. you start the backup, yeah. before you do a snapshot, you're clean. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't think you will get an integrity if you... Yeah, but we have, we have taken snapshots without doing checkpoints in the past and we have encountered these issues. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is about uh, uh, the bloat issue with uh, hot standby feedback. I yeah. didn't understand why would that happen. So um, what the hot standby feedback does is it says don't clean the data, okay. right? So that it doesn't remove rows from under it while it's running queries. So if it says don't remove the data, it, it says don't vacuum this data. For Not so running vacuum causes bloat. No, that's only for the, some period of time, right? only for the 10 seconds or 10 minutes. Um, that is true, but think about uh, reports running all the time, right? Which is which is the case. People keep running reports one after the other, okay. and this can quickly uh, add up, right? So one query runs after the other, like an April query, and then there's a March thing running somewhere there, and it quickly yeah. adds up. Yeah, thanks. No problem. Hi, here. Hi. Um, thank you. It was wonderful. Um, I have a question. So you said uh, when you were running uh, queries on your uh, reporting DB, right? Yeah. Uh, you said adding more cores help, but in Postgres, uh, your queries don't really run on multiple cores, right? Like if you're running one big single query, right? it doesn't help. So were it, you talking in account of having different big queries that are running that can run multiple cores or was just... Yeah. So each query um, will run on a separate connection, which is a process, right? So more cores you have, more queries you can run. Does okay, that make so sense? More queries you can run, not one single query. No, 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 no. Yeah, so okay. yeah, there, we can't parallelize queries at the moment. Um, not parallelize query execution. What we can parallelize, uh, like we can just have multiple queries that are running at the same point. So more cores you have, more reports you can run. That's it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Shriyari. Okay. We're not taking any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, please don't fill, forget to fill out your lucky draw coupon.